Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show folks, this is Tony coming to you from New Zealand and I have two of my close friends here in New Zealand joining me for an all Kiwi show. Chris and Matt, great to be chatting to you two guys again today. Yeah, great to be here, thanks Tony. Yeah, hi everyone, um, nice to be back with you all again, back with Chris and Tony. Yeah, and I think we will cover quite a few different things today on the show, um, a lot's been going on and uh, there's just so many possible topics. Uh, perhaps we should just begin a little bit for the first uh, wee bit with Chris, give us a little bit of a rundown on what's going on with the financial stuff at the moment. Well, there's a real biggie taking place at the moment. Um, if nobody's heard, which you probably won't hear it on the ma- any mainstream media near you anyway, but there's a um, something big happening be- behind the scenes. It started last Tuesday uh, in America uh, with their banking, uh, with their uh, central banking system over there. They they had to start bailing out uh, banks with. I think it was like $75 billion per night, and it's been happening since, and and they, they're saying it's going to happen until probably about the 11th of October. Now, that is a big um, uh, red flag uh, as far as uh, where, where our whole financial system is, is heading. Um, and I say that because the last time this happened was just prior to the 2008-2009 crisis, and it was... The, the the dissolving of Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, um, and, and what it is, it's they have what they call a, a repo rate. A repo rate is what banks use on a nightly basis, and what they do is is they borrow money off other sources of banks uh, to to keep them liquid. And what happened last week was, uh, oh, just to explain a bit further on that front. A repo rate is a is a very low rate of interest, which banks use to borrow short term. When I say short term, it's only for uh, a matter of hours up until up into a day day to four days sort of time, and they borrow it at like no more than two point I think it's two point five or two point seven five percent. And what happened last Tuesday was the bank lending rate went from that up to I think it was 10 percent um, and and the reason for that was is because it's like anything if you've if you've got a shortage of something then um, it, it'll cost you more so demand causes uh, prices to go up and and there was a lot of demand and yet not much supply so so the the percentage points went up on the on the amount of money that was able to be borrowed, and um, and what it tells you is there's not a lot, a lot of li- liquidity in the banking system. So yeah, it it is a biggie. It's it's behind the scenes. It's sort of one of those things that that are working um, out of vision, if you like. And yeah, we need to be watchful of of where it goes from here. That's interesting. There was an article too, I think just came out from Brandon Smith at altmarket.com and he's talking about a lot of this stuff, um, which a lot of it is, I'll be honest, stuff I don't fully understand. But it's I'll just a little piece of his article I'll read. He said, I don't think it's a coincidence that the crash of the everything bubble is accelerating around the same time that geopolitical chaos is erupting. We have a trade war that is unlikely to end with a US-China meeting in October that will probably produce little to no results. We have a Brexit circus which is supposed to play out in October. We have a crisis with Iran as the US is set to move troops into Saudi Arabia and the UAE in the next month. And now we have an impeachment inquiry circus erupting over Trump, Biden and the Ukraine. That sure is a lot of distractions for the general public as their economy crumbles around them. Matt, have you got any thoughts? Yeah, I'm just thinking that there's also other distractions like you've got that young girl, that 16-year-old girl, Greta Thunberg, um, who's made a speech to the UN um, 
that's also things like that are very distracting and they take people's thoughts away from um, what is actually going on. So, yeah, it's, as you say, Tony, it's all this other stuff that's going on that's distracting everyone away from what's really going on at the moment. And I'm, 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 I'm surprised that we haven't seen um, a financial collapse well before now. Yeah. Well, I'm suspecting it hasn't happened before now because they're still preparing <laughs> to have things into place that they want into place. When I say they, I mean the various elites. And um, and so they want to have something to replace it with when the financial crash happens. But it's certainly, I mean, it's definitely a decline into it. And it, we can see it really happening big time now. Anybody that can't see it or is burying the heads in the sand, it's time to really wake up. It's hard to know exactly how quickly it all plays out, but it is definitely playing out. And the other interesting thing is watching what's happening in the precious metals markets as it all mm. happens, you know, because there's days, the trend is upwards with silver and gold, but you have days where some little thing will happen and then all of a sudden there's a big whack down of the prices and all that. But what I'm seeing is, it it shows beyond a doubt that when things really do start ramping up into chaos and and um, you know financial crash territory, the things that are going to really skyrocket will be silver and gold, and we've got a small taste of that now. And I imagine you'd agree with that, Chris. Am I right? Yeah. So we had a bit of we've been having a bit of volatility in the markets as regarding precious metals, but that that that's sort of an ongoing thing anyway. But a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a big rise in the in the precious metal, in in particular silver. We're talking here. Um, silver went from seventeen dollars an ounce up to nineteen dollars an ounce uh, in a very short time. It had a pullback down to the seventeen dollar fifty ish range, and is trading in that range now. We are sort of looking towards a um, a bit of a. And, and up, there's more upward pressure coming on the silver market as well. It's looking like it'll probably go into the 20s pretty soon as well. Um, but as I say, it's a volatile market, the silver market. It could go either way, but it's looking more likely to be on the upside than the downside at this stage. Gold's been up around the $1,500 mark as well, give or take a bit. So, yeah, it's moving upwards. Now, uh, Matt, you mentioned that girl at Greta Thunberg at um, the UN yeah. and all of that. This whole uh, nonsense around climate change. I'm sorry, and our own Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern at the yeah, the New Zealand Prime Minister at the UN just spouting all this nonsense as well. And I, I felt embarrassed to be a, having her as our Prime Minister, to be honest. Yeah. And, and she's saying, well, this is just a quote from Jacinda Ardern, it's time for trade deals to become a force for good on climate action. Ardern said, fossil fuel companies should no longer reap benefits of subsidies that our farmers and many others have been asked to give up. And uh, basically there's a whole lot more she said with that, but she's just jumping on this globalist bandwagon, pushing the climate change agenda uh, and as a reason to tax New Zealanders, and it's the same thing that's happening globally. Yeah. It, it's also, there's another thing that comes out of it that concerns me quite a bit too, is that, um, and I'm just writing an article about this at the moment that'll be out shortly, it's the uh, brainwashing, to put it in, in its simplest terms of, this generation of people, I mean, it started many years ago, but it's really ramping up now to see that, you know, we have to save the planet. And it's it's all this agenda 2130 stuff. Um, you know, it's all based around pagan religions, really. It's that sort of thing. Soon you're not going to be able to, you know, mow your lawns or anything like that. That's an extreme example. But it's that sort of stuff where people will be watching you to see how you behave in terms of your uh, climate-friendly behaviour. And I can just see this stuff happening already. I watched that young girl, Greta Thunberg, and I, it just disturbs me that she can get up in front of the UN and 
it's almost a hysterical thing that is being applauded by many nations around the world. Uh, Tony, you mentioned Jacinda Ardern. You know, that, that they're applauding this young lady. And I've heard, seen articles that saying, you know, she's got the fa science facts behind her, but she doesn't have those science facts. I saw an article the other day and I cannot remember where I saw it. I have saved it and I can perhaps put it in the... Um, send it to you, Tony, to put it up. There were 500 scientists that sent a letter to the UN saying that the climate science is not sure in terms of that it is a man-made um, catastrophe and that they were basically saying we're not in a, a climate catastrophe. So this, this agenda is being whipped up to try to get people to think along a particular way. Um, and it's, I find it, it's quite disturbing because there'll be a lot of Christians who will go, well, I don't agree with this, that, you know, because it comes back to Romans chapter one, where it talks about um, people worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And that's what we've come back to now. And it's, it, it's very much a, a prophetic thing. And uh, we get people like Al Gore, who around about 13 years ago said that there was a decade left to save the planet from global warming. Well, OK, really? It hasn't changed that much yet. Sure, there's a few more storms and different things, but yeah, we, we haven't you know, had a cataclysm as he was predicting with no ice at the North Pole and, and polar bears being you know, basically... You know, paraphrasing that there wouldn't be any of those left, and so on. But in two thousand and one, Al Gore, his net worth was two million dollars. By two thousand and thirteen, it exceeded three hundred million dollars. And of course, he's got a lot richer than that now, based on his fear mongering about climate change. And that, that's all it is. And we've got Pope Francis, a big pusher of it, of course. Now, the kind of religious spearhead of the climate change fighting agenda we're just seeing a whole lot of people uh pushing this agenda to bring everyone into a world government ultimately and a one world religion and michael snyder put out an interesting article which uh, i think you've probably read matt theology students are being taught to confess their climate sins while sitting in front of a bunch of sitting in front of a bunch of potted plants this, that was the name of Michael Snyder's article and a little bit of it. He said, the folks at Union Theological Seminary are taking the concept of talking to your plants to a frightening new, ne new level. Each year, students at the seminary pay a ridiculous amount of money to go to the school and they are there to be trained to be Christian leaders of tomorrow. But instead, they are being taught to confess their climate sins to potted plants and eventually these impressionable young minds will be leading churches and Christian institutions all over America. And the following was posted by the official Twitter account of the Union Theological Seminary. It said, Today in chapel we confessed the plants. Together we held our grief, joy, regret, hope, guilt and sorrow in prayer, offering them to the beings who sustain us but whose gift we often fail to honour. What do you confess to the plants in your life? I mean, that's, that's insanity, but that's a Christian theological seminary. Right, and these people are going to be the leaders, the, the Christian leaders of the future, and as, as Michael put, and, and that's very disturbing. Um, I mean, I, I don't have any trouble with being a good steward of the environment and, you know, those sorts of things. I think God would expect us to look after our environment and not to be a polluter, th those sorts of things. Those are just kind of good common sense kind of things that that I think we as Christians should adhere to. But this is going beyond that. This is going well beyond it. And it has this whole footprint of um, a New World Order religion pasted all over it. Tony, as you mentioned, the Pope is, is um, bringing all these things together. He's very much a, a champion for the, um, you know, for climate action and 
and he also is a very much a, a, a champion for bringing one world religion together as well. He's he's signed that deal with the uh, Muslims, and you can just see all of this unraveling, literally unraveling before our eyes at the moment. That you know we've got the whole climate change thing, which is escalating into um, the worship of the planet and the worship of creation rather than God. God is being removed from this. And you see, once again, also the the whole idea of bringing religions together, all the world religions together under one banner, which is very much, um, you know, that new world order, uh, false prophet religion type thing, which Satan will quite happily get people to get involved in. And it takes God out of the picture. It's part of the falling away, isn't it? Yes. Yes. And it's also um, taken away what Scripture really says about the days we're living in. Matthew 24 and Luke 21 tell us that these things will happen. And the theological colleges are coming up with with this this nonsense. Um, They're not reading their word. They're not theological at all. Good point. That's a very good point. John Heller's latest sermon from the um, his fellowship about apostasy. It, it's very good. Um, John actually goes into detail about um, some of the misconceptions about apostasy. Second Thessalonians 2 talks about an apostasy, um, a falling away. And there are some Christians who have interpreted that as being the rapture because the word uh, in Greek can mean a departure. So they've interpreted that way. But taken in context, it actually means a falling away from faith. And John goes into a lot of detail about the Greek translations of that particular part of Scripture and other parts of Scripture which are saying similar things. So it's well worth a watch if you haven't seen it. You can find it on, um, I think it's the John Heller's, I, I forget the name of the website. It's the, his YouTube channel, church YouTube channel. It's great. John does a really good job of explaining what the apostasy is and what the apostasy isn't. I've got an article here that comes from um, a guy called Roger Oakland. And he talks about pathways to apostasy, 10 things to ponder. Um, the He starts off by saying that one of the things that you'll see is ecumenical unity. And that's really interesting because you're seeing that very much now where churches are being encouraged to be ecumenical, which is something, I mean, if you think that Christendom can all be under the same banner doing the same thing, I, I came out of the Catholic Church many years ago, and I know that there are many Catholics who are still in the Catholic Church who are, you know, they're good people, they're good, um, saved, spirit believing people, spirit filled people, but they need to come out of it because it's a false religion. Um, it is not. You know, it's not a, and I'm not bashing Catholics. I'm, I'm just saying that I don't believe that Catholicism is a, um, a genuine religion in terms of it's more of a, more of a cult. So I'm not get, I'll probably get a bit of flack for that. But um, there's a lot of things to say that it is that. The other thing you'll see is church growth movement, where you see these big, particularly new apostolic reformation. Um, these huge, big, seeker-friendly megachurches. They're emphasising sort of the seeker-friendly, come along, it's okay, don't worry, we're not going to um, preach sin, we're going to preach prosperity and feel good stuff. Good examples of that, probably uh, Joel Osteen uh, with his church in, in Texas, uh, Rick Warren, Saddleback Church in California, the, these sorts of groups. Um, another one is you see people following personalities, the cult of personality. You, you'll you see individuals being followed rather than um, a Bible-focused 
you know, church, you'll see, like, for example, you, you see a lot of these mega church pastors, Joseph Prince, etc. They People go to hear them. They go to see them. They go to be around them. Uh, rejection of biblical creation is another one that seems to be creeping in so much. People are rejecting the idea that um, God created the world in the way he said he did, um, that they're going to sort of more evolutionary based ideas. And you see also things like Eastern spiritual practices like yoga. Uh, I watched something yesterday that talked about a, a Christian lady who's involved in holy yoga. I mean, do these people not understand that yoga is, is a Hindu practice, is a Hindu religious practice? You can't equate these things with Christianity. Contemplated prayer, I've talked about that before. It's just drawing people into mystical experiences that, that I'll just say simply that open them up to demonic experiences. Social gospel is another one. It's that social justice. And I've heard this on our local Christian radio station advertising for social workers. Are you uh, socially driven? Are you driven to social justice? And we yes, we need to do social works. We need to do good social works as Christians. But it's that's not what the gospel is about. But there's a lot of people, people like Rick Warren, who believe that that attending to people's social needs will bring them to the gospel, and they leave the gospel out of it. Um, signs and wonders. I think we've all kind of seen that. Um, Chris and Tony, we've been involved in churches where signs and wonders have prevailed over biblical teaching. Yeah, so those are the things that Roger talks about that point to, towards apostate churches. Do you guys have any comments about that? Yeah, just the fact that they're embracing not only that, but that they're embracing a host of other things. Um, you know, of course, we've already mentioned the climate change and thing. There's a lot, you know, they're embracing that. And then, of course, the homosexuality side of things are embracing that. So, yeah, it, it's the world coming into the church, which is what we're warned of with the, with the Latter-day Church and, and, and the apostasy. And, Matt, you've actually done an article about the Laodicean church and how it compares to today's church. Yeah, um, just recently I just was just asking God what what do you want me to write about and it's taking me a while to write things at the moment because my concentration has been pretty poor lately but just felt that the spirit was kind of leading me to write about Laodicea. I know that many people have written about the Laodicean church and how it is for, for these days but it's just it was a particular aspect of it so I went and had a look at the scripture. It's Revelation 3 for anyone that wants to, to have a look. Specifically, it is Revelation 3, 14 to 19, where Jesus speaks to the Laodicean church. And I went and looked at the history of the actual city of Laodicea and then looked at the biblical description of Laodicea, and I looked at, compared that with how things are today, and it was really interesting. So just to to take parts of the article, the word Laodicea in Greek, laos means a people, and decia or dyke means a judicial hearing, a judicial decision, or a sentence of condemnation. And when you and you can interpret that as being meaning the people of the decision, Laodicea meaning the people of the decision, or the people of the opinion, or the self-opinionated critical people. And when I kind of heard that whole um, description, I thought of how things are today with the church. I've never heard such a group of people who are self-opinionated critical people. I'm talking about Christians here. When you go into um, chat rooms and forums and things like that, thank goodness it doesn't happen in the minute to midnight forum, but in other forums you see some really opinionated people. And I'm not talking about 
trolls or paid government sort of stooges. I'm talking about Christians who identify as Christians and who just absolutely go, this is my opinion, or they just say, this is what it is, how it is, and they just slam that. And I think Christians have to be very careful about how they treat one another. It seems now that because we have social media, the internet, people seem to have got this license to, you know, that their opinion is right, whatever they say is right, and that they can slam people because they're, you know, in, behind a computer screen and they're not actually next to that person. They feel as though they have some right to actually slam other people and i just i find that um quite distressing that we treat other each other really badly um and i have to look to myself and how i respond to people at times on the internet i and i look you know it's i'm not exempt from this either so i see this as very much a, a hallmark of the louder sin church so <sighs> Another thing that was interesting when I looked at the, the history of the Laodicean church, it, they had um, two water sources for the, the city of Laodicea. They both came from, they didn't have their own water source there. So they had water that came from a nearby city called Hierapolis, I think that's correct, which was a, from hot springs. So by the time it got to Laodicea, it was still quite warm. And then they had cold water that came from the nearby city of Colossae, which was quite cold. So when the two mixed, you got this lukewarm mixture of water. And it's interesting that Jesus talks about, I'd rather you be hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. And if you think about a lukewarm drink, you might expect be expecting cold or uh, a hot drink, if you get lukewarm, it's like, oh, yuck. You know, if you get a lukewarm cup of tea or a coffee, it's like people just want to spit it out. It's that same same kind of experience. So another interesting thing about the um, Church of Laodicea is that Jesus had nothing positive to say about the Church of Laodicea. It was all... Um, bad news, so to speak, or there was nothing, all the other churches that Jesus talks about, all the other six churches, there was something in them that Jesus had something positive to say, but not the Laodicean church. However, I think the, the good thing was is that Jesus gave advice about what the Laodicean church, and I'm, I'm saying that this is the church that we are in today. This is the church that we are in. We are the Laodicean church, and Jesus has nothing good to say about that. Um, okay, so what were the scriptural att attributes of the Laodicean church? Lukewarmness, as I've talked about, was one of those things. What is lukewarmness? Um, it's being indifferent. It's lacking passion. It's being uncaring. It's being mediocre and feigning neutrality, being wishy-washy, being half-hearted. Do we see Christians being like that today? And I'd have to say, yes, we do. It's very much a, a sign of, of Christians, a lot of Christians today. In their own minds, the Laodicean people couldn't consider themselves rich, wealthy, and having no lack. And they were rich and wealthy people. And I think we see that today. I mean, we, we are, for the most part, even though we think at times we're not well off, we are well off. Um, there, this is a time in history when, particularly in the Western world, we really lack for nothing in so many different ways. Um, we have really good medical um, care, health. We have, oft, you know, it's very um, rare that people can't have some sort of housing, those sorts of things. So we, we do, in the Western world particularly, have an abundance of resources that in times past people have not had. Jesus considered the Laodiceans wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So what was it about the Laodiceans that 
Jesus was saying. He was saying, you guys think you've got it all. You think you see it, you think you know it all, but in fact, you don't have anything. You know, saying that you are lacking good discernment and judgment. So he had suggestions to make to the Laodicean church, and I think that this is something that everybody listening to this can think about, is Jesus said, buy gold refined by fire from Jesus in order to become wealthy. Okay, so he was out saying that, buy gold from me refined by fire. Um, And no, Jesus wasn't a bullion dealer. He meant something else there. When, and this applies to all those prosperity people out there. Where, what wealth is it that we're asked to to look to, to obtaining? And that is that wealth that is stored up in heaven. It's not the wealth of the earth. We have to pay a price for that. Um, and often that price is a difficult price. Um, as a Christ, as a you know, as a Bible believing Christian, we go through problems. Satan is going to throw everything at us. Things are going to be difficult, but that is very much a refining process for us. It's like Job, although that's an extreme circumstance, Job lost everything, but in the end, because of his faithfulness to God, he regained things. He regained everything and more. The other thing that Jesus talks about is the shame of our nakedness. Why would we need to get to cover our nakedness? And I think often now that people are falling into mediocrity regarding sin, that, oh, you know, it's okay to be doing this or that or the other thing in terms of sinning and still going to church. It's it's those sorts of things that we just we just don't care about that stuff anymore. And the Bible's really clear about sin. It says if you sin, you know, you need to confess it to God. You need to confess it to one another. You need to deal with it. We are sinners. All of us are sinners. There's not one person who isn't a sinner. We know that. The Bible tells us that. But for Christians, we need to deal with those things as they come along. And we need to get them get them right. I believe that a lot of Christians today have a lot of sin in their lives that they're not dealing with. And that's that nakedness that Jesus talks about. The white robe is the the cleansing process. It's becoming clean. And we need to get ourselves clean. We need to confess our sin. We need to repent of their sin. Um, Jesus said to get some eye salve that we might see. What's that about? I mean, there'd be a lot of people to say today, a lot of Christians say, I'm fine, I'm okay. What I see and what I do is all right. What's wrong with it? And that's exactly the problem, is that they think what they're doing is okay, and they're not measuring it up against uh, a biblical standard. They're just measuring up against the world standards. There's a lot of errant teachings in the church today, a lot of heretical false teachings, particularly in, you know, Word of Faith and New Episode Reformation, the um, emergent church. There are a lot of things in those churches which are simply not biblical. They have nothing to do with Scripture. And when you closely examine them, you know, th- those things need to be We need to get rid of them. We need to get away from them, get right away from them, and we need to get away from the people who are preaching them as well too. That's the eye salve. We need to have our eyes opened to the truth. And the only way we do that is by getting back to Bible basics, reading our Bibles, um, you know, praying, and just those very simple scriptural things, reading what does the word say about things. God gave us the word for a, a very good reason, and that's to keep us in line. It's his, it's his word to us. It's our guideline. It's how we look at doing things. It's our measurement. It's our measuring stick, um, and we need to get back to it. So many Christians have got away from that. I think that's pretty much what I talked about in the, the article. Um, can you tell the listeners the name of the article and they can find it on the minute to midnight.com website? Sure. Okay, so the article is The People of the Opinion, Laodicea. That's the title of it. 
and it's uh, the latest article. If you go into um, select categories, um, which is over near the top of the website, just down from the banner, there's a box called categories on the right hand side. Under select categories, if you go to uh, Minuteman, Minuteman Matt's blog and click on that, it will be the first article that comes up. Um, and I might actually put it down on the um, the side bar of the A Minute to Midnight website as well for people to okay. click directly yep. on it there too. Yep. So it's a yep. featured article. Yep. I'm just thinking, like, I've talked a lot. I don't know how you guys feel about this. It just if you could talk a bit about people with their preparedness, because we, we're so close to something now, um, there's something's going to be happening soon. It's, you know, it's almost like it, it, I mean, for me, I feel that there's just this thing that's looming soon, whether it's a, a world crash or whether it's a war that started in the Middle East or whatever, something will happen soon in order to bring about chaos. And it's kind of getting that into people's thinking is what are you going to do when something happens? So my thinking along those lines is that many people are sort of not doing anything to prepare. They're saying things like God will look after them and, you know, people saying, well, Jesus sent them out without a second staff and a tunic and all of that. And my to me, those people, are, that's fine. If that's the way they're living all the time now, if they're going out owning nothing with nothing in their bank accounts and they just have one set of clothes or whatever, in there, then if they're going to live that way now, fine. I've got no problem with them living like, saying they're going to live like that in the future. But if it's, all that is is future talk when they're not actually living that way at all now, then I think it's pie in the sky and it's just an excuse to do nothing. And I'm thinking offhand, and I don't have the scripture in front of me, but the, when Jesus fed the 5,000 and there was a boy with, I think it was five loaves and two fish, or was it the other way around? And and Jesus multiplied all of that and fed the 5,000 and they took up 12 ba baskets. Forgive me if I haven't got the details quite right because I haven't got it in front of me and this is just off the top of my head. But basically... It, they, re they got 12 baskets of the fragments afterwards. So the five loaves and two fish were multiplied that much by Jesus so that that fed 5,000 people. But the point of the matter is, if the boy hadn't had the foresight to bring the loaves and the fish, there would have been nothing for Jesus to multiply. So in a sense, that boy was prepared and God used that preparation and multiplied it. So I have, you know, no problems with people that have nothing and can't do much. But if people are, are, are doing some preparation now with the thought that they're actually going to help other people when things go down instead of just looking selfishly to bunker themselves down and help nobody. But the ones that are prepared to actually give out of what they have, then I believe God will multiply that and be able to do a lot with it. So, and that's going to be different for every person as to how they prepare. But I, I personally feel, and I know the three of us are the same here, we believe in preparing because we know something's coming and God's laid it on our heart for several years now to be doing this. And so I suggest to people to, to pray about it and ask God, what can you personally do to prepare for the tough times that are ahead? And it'll be different from each person, but then God can multiply that. But don't do nothing and go, God will look after me. Meanwhile, you're playing on your PlayStation and you're buying the latest iPhone or you're, you know, thinking about extending on your house, but you haven't got any money to do anything else or whatever it is or, you know, going to the picture theatre or something when you could be thinking, okay, what does God want me to do with his money that I do have? Is there something I can prepare with? So those are my thoughts on it. Uh, Chris, have you got anything to add to that and, and Matt? Yeah, I think you said it well, Tony, and that was a good analogy with with the loaves and the fishes, but there's so many analogies in the Bible which you can refer to. And what, what you're sort of saying is that people are, are saying, 
um, they're, they're either using faith or blind faith. Now, you can determine which is which, but I think blind faith could well be the ones that go, oh, well, God will look after us. You know, we don't, we don't need to. I think real faith is when you do put something into action. And one great example was, is, is Noah. And, and he spent years and years and years and years of preparation. And, and we know what happened there. So there's one example. Um, and, well, you know, another example added to the one that you've just used, Tony. But uh, we're certainly living in times where uh, we can see things to start, or there's certainly birth pangs about. And, you know, I've already mentioned about the financial side of things and a warning there that's taking place as we speak. What are you going to do with that? You know, are you just going to, oh, yeah, put your head in the in the sand and say, God will look after me? Or is God actually saying to you through this uh, broadcast, hey, you need to be doing something? And um, whatever that preparation might be, start looking at what prepping is if you haven't already and um, start putting aside some stuff ready for it. T- time that probably coming, not possibly, but probably, and and start prepping and you know, in in the way of food, sh- um, make sure. First of all, you got to you got to have your house in order, your spiritual house in order. Then get your physical house in order with food, and make sure you do have a house that's got shelter and stuff. And then and then of course your financial side as well. Whereas we've proclaimed on here a number of times, silver and and gold are probably good good items to have um, in a, in a financial crisis. So that's about my take on it. Matt, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I, Tony, I agree with you completely in that there are a lot of people who say, "Why should I prepare?" Because God will just take look after me, you know, but these are people who have plenty of money and they have the ability to prepare, but they choose not to because they say that God will look after them. I have a lot of concern about that because people are holding on to their finances because they want to buy something like a new house or a new car or something like that, which they treasure more. When I, I remember when I felt God was just saying to me to get some extra kind of food a few years ago, it was, it was very clear, God was very clear that it wasn't just for me, that it was about, it was for other people as well too. And Tony, I love that analogy, as you pointed out, Chris, with the boy that had the um, five loaves and two fishes, that or the other way around, which one it was. Um, he he brought those things because he was prepared and Jesus multiplied them. Um, and we see other examples in scripture. You know, it's like you look to Joseph, who's a type of Jesus, um, with the famine that came on Egypt. He said, look, let's put aside, you know, a lot of grain, which will see us through the famine years. God did the same thing with Noah. You know, he had the ark stocked with provisions to see them through that period of time that they would be adrift on the oceans until they settled on dry land. So there's the the principle of being prepared, that, that preparedness is there. I completely agree that there are going to be people that will be caught unawares of this, um, that don't know what to do. and you know, God knows who those people are, but I, w- I really struggle with those people who have the means to prepare and don't do it in the face of knowing that that would be a good thing to do. So, yeah, that's my take on it too. And just to, just to add to that too, we've got to remember there's the the, the parable of the, the ten brides. Five are ready and five weren't. Five were told, you know, get ready. They had the... the they had the ability to get ready, but they just didn't through lack of discipline, through laziness, through it wasn't through a lack of resource. 
It was just that they decided, no, I don't need to. I don't see any urgency to. And that's that's where we're living today. People are living in that that mindset. Why should we get ready? And, you know, the rapture is going to take us out or, you know, they've got all these other excuses. But, hey, we've got to, we've got to do something practical. Um, God wants us to be motivated, not demotivated, not to do nothing but to do something. I think it's that, it's the loudest in church. It's that, you know, if you look at it, people just, they can't be bothered and they don't care and, and they're so wrapped up in whatever it is they're doing. Um, yeah. And, and, it, and it's because there's a lack of revelation. We live in a society today, you know, the word says without a vision that people will perish. Well, the, the word doesn't actually say that. The word actually says without a revelation the people will cast off restraint. And that's what we're seeing today. They haven't got revelation because no one's speaking revelation in their midst. And they're not even speaking the book of revelation because they're scared of it or it's too negative for their paradigm. So so therefore, there's the problem. There's no revelation coming. The um, the revelation is... is stuff which is is in the Bible already, and it's because people don't read their Bibles. Um, and Daniel talks about um, things being opened up to us um, as the end days you know draw near, um, and that they'll be opened up more and more. So it's it's things that are there in the Bible already that we're seeing opened. I mean, I think of the whole area of technology. Um, things have just, you know, expanded hugely um, in the last, even the last 10 years, things have changed dramatically. I was hearing today that Google has cracked the um, quantum computing thing and they put a uh, program into it that would take a supercomputer 10,000 years to do, and it did it in about three and a half minutes. This is the type of technology that we're, we're looking at today. Things have just exploded. People don't have a revelation of of anything, you know, especially in these days we're living in. There's no revelation to say, hey, get ready, be prepared. The, you know, there's, there's, there's an economic disaster coming. There's, there's other disasters coming like nat- natural phenomenon. Well, yeah. you know, earthquakes and yeah. volcanoes erupting, stuff like that. People don't want to know. The revelation's there, but they're not picking up on it. Yeah, yeah. Or they're disguising it uh, with New World Order terminology like climate change and saying man needs to, you know, stop driving cars and, and not have so many cows because there's too much carbon dioxide and other nonsense to disguise the fact that actually we are living in the end times that the Bible predicted are coming. And so those that do have their eyes open will be going, aha, haven't I seen this somewhere? It says this in the Bible. And therefore they prepare knowing that the the very signs that the Bible tells us will come at the birth pangs before the end are what's happening now. So, yeah, I I think it's just a, a word for people to open their eyes and not only that, but open their hearts and, and pray, asking God what to do. What does God want them as individuals to do at this time now? Because it's too late to do it after the event. If there's, for argument's sake, say there's you live somewhere and there's a massive earthquake or whatever and everything, infrastructure falls over. It's too late to make your preparations afterwards. Same with if there's a big financial collapse, which it's inevitable, it's going to happen. Whether it happens in the next little while or whether it's a bit further down the track, uh, statistically it's just going to happen. So it's too late to prepare afterwards. Be prepared now. But at the same time, let's not be in panic mode. I certainly don't believe in fear-mongering or creating panic because it's not about that because under panic, you tend to do the wrong things anyway. So it should be more like a reasoned response done through prayer, you know, praying to God. What does God want us individually to do? And it'll be different from one person to the next. But it's got to come with get into the prayer closet, pray about it, and then go, okay, God, show me what to do. And it might be whatever it is, be something that's 
might be different than what your neighbour's doing or whatever, but, you know. So I guess we should look to to wrap up, guys. Have you got any final sort of thoughts that you'd like to add? I'll just give you Chris first and then Matt, see if you've got anything to add. You just on that revelation thing again, I think, are we looking to the revelation of God or the revelation of man? And, of course, the revelation of man is, is speaking all this stuff about climate change and what have you and global warming. You know, and we're not looking to the revelation of God, which speaks about it anyway. And it's it's God's warning, like he he, he talks about in once again Matthew twenty four and Luke twenty one and the book of Revelation. Um, so yeah, and and we're not here to fear monger. We're not here to to um, be doom and gloom. We're here to to enlighten people on what is actually going on and, and to be ready for something that's upon us. Um, and don't be scared. I mean, I've heard this say, saying before, don't be scared, but be prepared. And um, as, as, you're, as you've already said, Tony, we're not to fear, but in a way we are to fear. We've got to fear God. And, and that's the fear we should have. And when we fear him, we'll see it for what it really is. And, and we'll take notice. We'll, we will sit up and, and be watchful. That's about it. That's all I've got to say. Yeah, just the thing that comes to me is that um, because we are living in, in the last days, in the end times, in Matthew 24, Jesus says four times, do not be deceived. And I think that's a, a hallmark of the age that we live in is deception. So please test everything. Test everything we say on this program, you know, in terms of scripture and all those sorts of things. Test it. Don't just take it for granted. Test everything that comes through the pulpit at church. Test everything against scripture. What does scripture have to say about it? Get into your word. Read read your word. As Tony pointed out, get into your prayer closets. What does God want you to do this time? God knows your circumstances. He knows all our circumstances. So there'd be something that God will want you to do, whether it's preparation, anything like that. So, yeah, those those are my final thoughts. Yeah, good words from both of you guys. And folks, don't forget our website, a minute to midnight.com. Visit it. Uh, and also this video, give us a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel if you aren't already or if Google hasn't removed you, your subscription. And also we do put the shows on iTunes and on our website, a minute to midnight.com. A Minute to Midnight is run 100% by donations and we really do appreciate that when folks donate uh, it's not like a huge number of people do but it is very much appreciated and we can't run them into midnight without your help so thank you to the people that do donate and and keep this running and we much appreciate it and the music that's used in the shows i've written and played and recorded and that's also found for download on the minute to midnight website I think that's probably about it for this show and thank you for listening folks and I want to say thank you to Matt and Chris, uh, both you guys for being on the show with me today and it's good to be an all Kiwi contingent every now and then. Thanks Tony, Chris and thanks folks for listening. Yeah, thank you too too and uh, yeah, bye folks.